is the World According to Zig podcast for June 9, 2019. My name is John Ziegler. I'm the host of this show where you can still get the truth about the news of the day from a conservative perspective in this world turned upside down. Our website is freespeechbroadcasting.com. And it's at freespeechbroadcasting.com where you can get a link to my other podcast, which we also did a new episode of today, which focuses on news related directly to President Donald Trump called Individual One. So if you're interested in political news and news related directly to Trump, make sure you check out the Individual One podcast, which today features a really awesome interview with CNN contributor Tara Setmare. And I urge you to check that out if you have any interest in doing so. Today, we've got a lot of things to get to on the World According to Zig podcast. I had um, my lunch, which had been (laughs) scheduled for a couple of weeks, uh, finally with the lawyers who are representing the Michael Jackson estate in all matters related to Michael Jackson, specifically with regard to the lawsuit against HBO for the Uh, so-called documentary Leaving Neverland, uh, Brian Friedman and Howard Weitzman. I want to tell you all about that because that was fascinating on a number of levels. And I had a follow-up phone call after that uh, lunch, which was also very interesting. Uh, And it's changed my view a little bit uh, of the nature of the case and where this is all heading. But in conjunction with that, although unrelated directly, uh, we have scheduled an interview which I have high hopes for, uh, with a guy who actually worked on the film. Although it's a little bit vague as to whether or not he was working on the film or directly or indirectly, but regardless, he was there while Dan Reed was filming Wade Robson, one of the two main accusers against Michael Jackson in the uh, film Leaving Neverland, where we have been at the forefront of exposing what a fraud that uh, so-called documentary, uh, I believe it was a fictional film, really was. And his name is Kevin Lipsy. Kevin Lipsy was hired as a sound man to work an event where Wade Robson, one of these two main accusers in Atlanta, Georgia, in early uh, part of last year, was being filmed doing a dance class by Dan Reed, the director of Leaving Neverland, for this so-called documentary. And Kevin Lipsy, a couple weeks ago, posted on Facebook some video clips of his interaction. Well, not necessarily his interaction, but, but video clips of him being at this taping. Uh, it showed Wade Robson. It showed Dan Reed uh, with his camera filming everything that was going on at this dance class. It was clearly uh, at least intended to be part of the Leaving Neverland documentary. And what was most interesting was that Kevin Lipsy uh, indicated in his Facebook posting with these videos that he had had interaction with Wade Robson that was inconsistent with what Wade Robson said in Leaving Neverland. And he was pretty vague about it. And I reached out uh, to Kevin, and apparently, <laughs> apparently lots and lots and lots of other people did as well, mostly Michael Jackson fans, wanting to find out, okay, what do you mean by this? This is you know, kind of cryptic, but it's potentially very significant. If, if you were there essentially working on the film or at least an event that was part of the film, and you, you have a, a, an experience with Wade Robson that's inconsistent with what he said in Leaving Neverland, then that's potentially important information. And I spoke to Kevin a couple of times, asked him whether or not he wanted to do an interview. I, I even spoke to someone who else who was there that day who was a colleague of Kevin's. And Kevin has graciously agreed, finally, after he's taken his vacation and before uh, he heads to church today, uh, to speak to us about his experience. And so let's talk to him now. Kevin Lipsy, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, John. Thank you for having me. Kevin, I want to start by asking you to tell a little bit about yourself, what you do for a living, and just so people can get a chance to know you a little bit better. Uh, Certainly. I am a sound engineer uh, here in Atlanta. Uh, I've been doing sound for, I think, about 20 years now. And um, also, I am a minister as well. What kind of minister? Um, I am what they call like an evangelist type minister. I just go around to several different churches, uh, you know, just teaching the Word of God. 
A Christian minister? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. And so uh, the reason why I've asked you to, uh, to speak with me is because you have had a very interesting experience with the, the film Leaving Neverland, although you didn't know at the time that you were involved in the film Leaving Neverland. So sometime last year, by the way, do you, do you remember when it was last year that this happened? Um, I believe it was in March or April of last year. Okay, so March or April of last year, you get hired as a sound guy to do a gig, correct? That's correct. And what do you know about the gig when you get hired? Uh, well, John, that's the interesting part about the whole situation. I knew nothing too much of the gig. We only knew that uh, there was a guy that wanted us there, um, uh, his name was Wade Lobson, and um, we were just there to provide not only sound reinforcements, but uh, an actual band for a class, a choreography class for Wade Robinson. All right, and to be clear, it's, it's Wade Robson, not Robinson. Right, Robinson. Right, okay, I'm so. Yes, Robson, right. Okay, and you didn't know who Wade Robson was at that time? No, I certainly didn't. Um, I found out, I think during the course of the evening, maybe halfway during the course of the evening, I found out uh, exactly who he was. All right. Well, let's we'll get Thank to you. that. We'll get to that in a minute. So, so you um, show up and and you're part of uh, is, would you call it a band, a group of musicians? I mean, you, tell me about the group you're part of that gets hired to do this gig. Um, it's a group of guys, um, and let me add this, a, a group of guys who awesomely, I mean, grew up, um, I think that, um, grew up on Michael Jackson, all of us kind of grew up on Michael Jackson albums, records, or whatnot, but we're just a group of guys, man, that, um, here around town in Atlanta, we just go around doing different venues, uh, and different events and things of that nature, uh, so it's really nothing special. It was just one of those situations where, we were hired to do something, and um, we accepted it. Um, but like we said earlier, we did not know exactly what we were actually getting into until and, later on. And to be clear, you, you're a lifelong fan of Michael Jackson? Lifelong fan of Michael Jackson. Even I'm a PK, so <laughs> I didn't get to listen to his music very much as, as, you know, as a young child. Uh, but later on, when I became a teenager and kind of left my mom's house, I kind of uh, you know, I started listening to Mike a lot. Right, but you you had no knowledge that this gig had anything to do with Michael Jackson when you guys took it, correct? No knowledge whatsoever. All right. None. So so you show up to this gig. All you know is that you're providing sound slash music for a, a, a. Did you know about the dance portion of this? That this was some sort of a dance class. Is that right? Yes, it's a sort of uh, dance class that Wade does. Yes, and you didn't have any knowledge that this was being videotaped or filmed for for a documentary, did you? Absolutely not. No, absolutely not. Okay, so so you show up, and this is an all day affair, right? Uh, and uh, I mean, but do you remember how many, approximately how many hours you guys were there for? Who was hard to tell because because I do um, audio engineering. Um, I typically get there before the other guys. So me, myself, it was probably an eight to ten hour day for me. Okay. So you get there and you meet Wade, correct? Yes. And tell me about your, your meeting with, with Wade. How'd that go? Well, it went really well. Um, some portion of the evening, uh, of course, being a sound engineer, I get to talk to a lot of different people, including Dan. Uh, Wade and other technical people, uh, and so you're talking about when you say hold on a second. When you say when you say Dan, you're talking about Dan Reed, the director of Leaving Neverland. Yes, I'm talking about Dan Reed. Okay, yes. all right. So go so go back to okay. Go ahead and tell us your story about uh, meeting Wade. Uh, when I met Wade, um, I was already told by a friend of mine who was actually there on the gig with me um, who he actually was. I did not know who Wade was. Um, when I first saw him, uh, as you stated before, I did not know as to the reason why we were there. Uh, but when I finally talked to Wade, um, I started off a conversation, something like, hey, man, I heard you, uh, you know, used to work with Mike and this, that, and another. And I proceeded to ask him questions in terms of, you know, 
how was that, you know, working with Mike, this, this, that, and another being with Mike. That, And uh, Wade told me nothing but good things about Mike. Um, he spoke very highly of him. Uh, he actually accredited Mike for what he was actually doing um, presently to um, this day uh, in terms of dancing and choreography and things of that nature. So I had no reason to think that um, none whatsoever just by how he spoke to Michael, his body language, um, he spoke to uh, Michael's character, this, this, that, and another. And so I had no reason to think that this was some sort of documentary that was speaking against Michael. All right, so this is obviously the crux of the story, uh, so I want to go through it a couple times. So to review, uh, you're there, you don't know who Wade Robson is, but you have a friend who's there with you. I guess, was this a person who's in the band, or was this a musician? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so a musician, yes, so a musician recognizes Wade Robson, correct? Mm-hmm. All right, and yeah. they say, and they say, hey, that's the that's the dude that was uh, close to Michael Jackson, right? I mean, is that, is that was was that the context? Right, absolutely. And so, of course, as a Michael Jackson fan, this piques your interest, correct? Yeah, absolutely. Right. I mean, of course, you know, you're, you're a big fan of Michael Jackson. This is a guy who's connected to Michael Jackson. You're there to do a gig. So, of course, and you've got lots of time because that's, you know, that's what happens at these events. And so you're going to pick his brain about Michael Jackson. That's a perfectly natural thing to happen, right? Absolutely. Okay. And, and so when you do that, you get nothing but positive things about Michael Jackson from Wade Robson, correct? Not, nothing but positive things. Do you remember any quote or anything close to a, co- a quote in particular about Michael Jackson from Wade Robson? Um, I think that one that really sticks uh, in my mind is, is that, uh, like I said, he accredits Michael for what, what he's actually doing. Um, and like I said, he really spoke very highly of Michael. Uh, he praised. <clears throat> I, would go, I would go up so far and say that he really praised Mike. So, um like I said, you know, once things actually kind of, you know, kind of over the evening kind of unfolded, uh, I I just found it, John, honestly very hard to believe um, that this man was inappropriately touched by Michael Jackson. And why did you come to that conclusion? Like I said, it's just his body language uh, in terms of when he talked about Mike. Um, it, it's just his overall just overall disposition. Uh, you clearly saw, I mean, I, don't, I did. I clearly saw. And, you know, you kind of, over the course of the evening, you kind of just kind of put things together after talking with Wade, after talking with Dan, you kind of, and talking amongst ourselves as musicians and all that. We, we just kind of put things together. We were um, <clears throat> talking once. I remember one time we were talking amongst ourselves and we were saying, man, there's no way uh, that, you know, this guy was inappropriately touched or, you know, this, that, and another. Uh, because I didn't really get that information until the friend of mine actually brought it to me. I mean, I had no clue okay. what was actually going right. on. I want, to make I, really sure, I want to make sure we have the timeline correct here. So you mm-hmm. go in there, no knowledge why you're even there. You don't even know who Wade Robson is. You get told who Wade Robson is, not in the context of sex abuse, but in the context of he was a guy who danced with Michael Jackson, correct? There was no, there was the fir, the fir, your first context of, of Wade Robson had nothing to do with sex abuse, correct? Right. Okay. Not. All right. And so you have this, you have this conversation with Wade. Hey, dude, heard you, you uh, were close to Michael. What was that like? He gives you nothing but praise, for, which is what I'm assuming you're expecting. It all is well and good. And then based upon our previous conversations, and correct me if I'm wrong, but what what something trans there's there's a tra- transformation as the day goes on, as the documentary starts to get filmed, and Wade starts to make uh, statements that I think you referred to as almost like he's talking in code that makes you start to think what the heck's going on here. Is that a fair assessment of what happened? Yes, that's absolutely fair. He started uh, speaking in what I call encrypted messages, uh, not only to parents, but the kids and the teenagers that was act- that were actually present in the room. And let me go ahead and say this again, unsuspecting, totally unsuspecting as to the real reason why we were actually there. Uh, so you had two versions of Wade, in my estimation. Uh, <clears throat> one estimation was, I mean, one portrayal was 
Wade in a sense where he's praising Michael Jackson, this is that another uh, very cool guy. But when the camera started rolling, um, he started portraying himself as this victim. Now, the reason why I say that, now, I didn't know it at the time until later. And also when I finally saw the documentary, and I'm saying to myself, wow, that's, that's not what he portrayed to me. That's not what he portrayed to me. And so everything became evidently clear at that point that, you know, what they were actually after. Um, so, All right, now, so this is another this is another important point of the story. So it sounds to me, again, please correct me if I'm wrong, it sounds to me as if what you're describing is that Wade Robson is there effectively like an actor in a, on a movie set where off, when the camera's not on, He's, he's real, and he's talking about Michael in what you perceive to be an honest way. And then Dan Reed's camera turns on, and they start filming for the documentary, and all of a sudden he's a different person, like he's playing a role as an actor. Is that fair? That is very fair. That is very fair. And, very t- fair. and, t- and tell me why you proceeded that way. Well, like I said before, um, he came off to us as very genuine. Uh, a very cool guy. Uh, and you know, I don't know if you know this or not, but, you know, when you are talking to a lot of musicians, man, there are, there are several different conversations that are going on. And usually it's just guys just really talking to guys. So you can really kind of just let down your hair and just be a guy. And uh, and that's what Wade was. Uh, he was very comfortable around us, uh, very transparent in terms of, you know, just him being just just a regular guy. I mean, uh, with some guys, he even actually exchanged numbers. He told us that he wanted to work with us again. Uh, he absolutely loved our professionalism, this, that, and another. But he just seemed like a regular guy. Now, when the cameras was um, when the cameras came on, he started talking encrypted messages. Um, and I'm at my station, and I'm just kind of looking because I also provided an audio feed uh, to Dan and his crew. And so. Um, He's talking um, to the kids that were in the room. Uh, in my estimation, I think that a lot of people that were in that room were, you know, like I said before, very unsuspecting of why we were actually there. And it was almost like he became just another person, this huge victim that we had never seen. And so when he started talking in these codes, these encrypted messages, um, it became very evident. Uh, at that time, that now this has gone to another level here. Now, and so I, I'm sorry to interrupt, but so I'm I just sorry. when you say these encrypted messages talking in code, you're getting the sense he's a victim, but you don't at this point know a victim of what, do you? No, I absolutely do not know at all. I'm still. I'm still kind of in the dark in my timeline. I'm still in the dark because now the cameras are on and um, I don't have time to kind of like talk to my friend that was actually there because he knew more about the situation because he actually booked the actual gig. And so um, I didn't have time to actually talk to him. So as you can imagine, I'm, I'm standing at my station and I'm listening to all this. I'm providing sound reinforcements for Wade. Um, and also the band. Um, and so I'm just trying to put all this stuff together. I really am, Dan. I, uh, I really am, uh, John. I yeah, don't, please, don't call, please don't call me Dan. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. You're not, you're not Dan. You're not Dan. <laughs> I, I understood. So, um, so, so you must have been rather confused at this point. You're still not connecting this to Michael Jackson in any way, are you? Not at all. So, Not at all. Okay, so when does that change? When do you start to realize what, what's really going on here? Well, after uh, the video shoot, actually, uh, not video shoot, but a documentary. Now I know it was a documentary. Um, after things kind of wrapped up, um, the musicians, we kind of huddled up uh, together, and we just started just comparing notes. I mean, as we would normally do with any gig. You know, how did it go? You know, how did everything sound? Oh, man, you guys did really well, this kind of stuff. And so one of the guys kind of brought up this whole thing again, which I think it was good for me because I really wanted to know. And so I started asking more questions. <laughs> and um, 
when we actually started, you know, conversing about it and talking about it, um, that's when we just kind of put one and two together. We were like, wait a minute. So this guy says he was with Michael Jackson. Now these guys are saying that they're doing something for uh, either Netflix or HBO. Um, and now I understand why he was saying these things. So I asked my friend, I said, man, is this guy, I said, is this guy alleging that Michael has done something to him? And um, he says, man, I really don't know. He says, I really don't know. But he says, he says, something changed. And I said, absolutely something changed. I said, did you hear how he was talking? And we were just kind of conversing with one another. And, and they were like, yeah. But then we were like, well, he wasn't talking to us like that when we were just kind of, you know, just guy talk. It was almost just like you said, it was almost just like an act. It was just, it was a well-planned act. Uh, even to the, to the point where the kids that were in the room, like I said, I know that they had no idea because I actually spoke to some of the teenagers. Honestly, man, they were just actually glad to be in the same room with someone who had been with Michael Jackson. But they didn't know about the abuse allegation I'm taking. They didn't know. They didn't know at all. Okay. No now, 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 the person you just described having that conversation with where you're comparing notes, uh, c can you mm -hmm. tell me anything about them, their name or who they are, something like that, just so we have some verification of this? Oh, yes. He's uh, Alan, Alan Smith, um, very close friend of mine, uh, world-renowned uh, musician, keyboardist. Um, he plays with some many artists around the world. Um, very, very great guy. Very okay, guy. well, now, I spoke to Al. Uh, you gave me his number because I asked you. Uh, and mm -hmm. this is certainly natural for this kind of thing to happen because this was over a year ago. And, and Al speaks very highly of you and witnessed you speaking to Wade uh, before, you know, the, everything got started and has no doubt at all that you're telling the truth about the nature of your conversation with Wade. But Al does not recall, at least in my conversation with him, you guys having a conversation that night about uh, saying, hey, Wade's not telling the truth here about Michael Jackson. Do you, do you have any explanation for why Al doesn't recall that? Um, like I said, Al and I, we work together on a lot of projects here uh, in Atlanta. And um, during the course of any gig or um the clients that we do have, there's a lot of moving components. There are a lot of things that are going on. He's doing one thing, I'm doing another. Um, he's handling the financial end. I'm handling um, all of the audio, even the equipment, the breaking down and such, coordinating certain things. And so uh, that could be one reason uh, because we were just kind of in and out of conversations here, there, um, where he had to be excused or I had to be excused. Uh, in order to take care of something. So, so you think? So you think it's? It, you think it would be perfectly natural based upon the circumstances? He just doesn't remember that part of the conversation. Yeah, oh, it's perfectly natural. I mean, we forget, man. Uh, plus, we're getting older too. <laughs> 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 I know. I know the feeling. I, I know the feeling. Yeah. Um, so. Okay. So and 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 frankly, I found what Al told me to be very credible because he did not want to say something he wasn't sure about. Al is a very seems like a very particular guy. He's not going to tell me something that he doesn't know 100% actually happened. And again, he he spoke uh, to your veracity and said if you say it, it must be true. So I'm not concerned about it. I'm just trying to come up with an explanation for why you have a slightly different recollection. But but the, there's a couple other elements regarding Al that are important. Al also says that you guys, when you got paid for this uh, gig, you, first of all, you got paid really well. Uh, is that consistent with your recollection? Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. and, and you got paid by a company named Jump. And my understanding is yeah. that that company uh, is Wade Robson's company. Not, 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 yeah. and not having anything, anything to do with Dan Reed or HBO or leaving Neverland. Or, so, is is that consistent with your understanding? Very consistent, yes. And did you yeah. know you were being paid by Wade at the time? No, I, I honestly didn't. Like I said, Al handles that part of it, and so when he gave me my check, 
uh, that's when uh, I believe that he told me then uh, who it was actually from. Did that and surprise? So, did that uh, su- did that surprise you that you were being paid by Wade's company? Uh, at the time, it it didn't. Um, but looking back on it, I can see how uh, that would look kind of you know kind of suspect. I really can. Uh, you, you have to understand, John, that I mean I was there on a paid gig, getting paid very well. I could care less where the money was coming from at that point. <laughs> right. So, but looking back in hindsight, um, I could see how that would be kind of you know you know. Suspect. Well, the, it's very strange. I mean, the whole thing is very strange because I, 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 it sounds to me like you guys were hired by Wade to provide sound and music for a dance class and that that he then invited Dan Reed to come in and film the thing. Like, he's putting on this production so that Dan Reed can put it in a movie, but... But it, it's it, so it really wasn't technically part of leaving Neverland. I, the, is that is that your well, understanding? That right. That's a fair and accurate assessment um, of the actual evening. Uh, like I said, we were brought in uh, okay, for but, that very reason of actually doing sound and having a live band for a dance class. But but uh, but normally but normally but normally Wade Robson no, normally no one would hire you guys just to do a dance class right the whole reason why you're doing that dance class is that Dan Reed and you have video of Dan Reed with a camera there the only the only reason why you got hired is because this is for a major movie correct right. I mean, there would be no reason to hire you. I mean, you don't do a dance class with a with a orchestra unless there's a something really major going on. You you just put on music. I mean, that, that would make no sense from a financial standpoint, especially when you're paying people really well. I mean, how many people do you think were in your group that got paid that day? Oh man, let me see. Let me do a count in my head. Just I'll give me an estimate. Give me an estimate. So with a keyboard, it's a bass player, a lead guitar player, that's three, a drummer, that's four, a percussionist, that's five, um, probably about six guys. Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, Wade Robson is, <laughs> is not a uh, a major celebrity rolling in dough. He's not going to – it makes no sense financially to hire a, 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 a full band uh, at top dollar – so that he can teach a dance class for I mean I know that I mean apparently uh, these people are paying you know decent money to be part of the dance class but it it doesn't make a lot of sense to me uh, especially when you're not a, a massive celebrity rolling in dough it just feels it feels like the money might be coming from somewhere else do you, do you get that sense at all yeah that that could be a possibility John absolutely it could be a possibility like I said I mean. You could just tell there was a collective effort to suppress, like I said, the real reason as to why we were there. Um, there was there was a huge collective effort on Dan's part as well as Wade, um, for that matter, to keep this. Okay, don't tell me about that. What do you mean? What do you mean by that? You said there's a, a collective effort by Dan to suppress why we were there. What do you What do you base that statement on? Well, you know, after talking with Dan, um, you know, of course, we talked on a technical level. Uh, and so during our conversation, I asked Dan, and I asked him, I said, man, what, why are we here? What is this for? Uh, I believe, that, if I remember correctly, he said either Netflix or HBO. Of course, it came out to be HBO in the end. Uh, and so um, when talking with him, um, I would ask, you know, just certain questions and uh, he would give me very short answers, you know, like, um, man, hey, why, why are we really here? Uh, you know, what is this actually for? Uh, when is this actually going to, you know, when is this actually going to show? Because they made us sign these, um, this paper where um, I think for our a release form or something like that, for our, for our image in the video. And so uh, they did make us sign those, um, but it, it was just, you could just tell he had he wanted no part of us just really trying to get deeper into a conversation. Just really. Mm-hmm. Well, of course, in his defense, I mean, in, in in his defense, he's he's busy, 
Uh, you know, he might not want to wanted to tell people about what was going on with the project. He didn't know 100 percent sure where it was going to air. So, I mean, there's some explanation for that. But but there's but it's it's clear from your account that Dan Reed was not forthcoming with information. He certainly didn't tell you, yes, this is for a documentary about Michael Jackson being a sex abuser, correct? Oh, absolutely not. I mean, I've worked with a lot of celebrities um, on movie sets, on uh, doing audio on movie sets, just in live applications where we actually had to work with a lot of people. They're not shy about telling you as to the reason why we're doing what we're doing. Uh, usually people like to brag on those types of things because they're proud of their accomplishments. Sure. This was the opposite. This was the opposite. No one wanted to say the real reason why we were there. Sure. Fair enough. Um, last thing. So the reason why I'm even aware of your story is that uh, a couple of weeks ago you posted some of these video clips that you took while there that included Wade and uh, Dan Reed on Facebook. I'm curious, mm-hmm. the, the reaction to that that you got, uh, mostly from Michael Jackson fans who are, who are eating up every possible piece of information about this story, what was the reaction to your postings in comparison to what you expected? Um, John, I have to tell you, I did not expect the onslaught that happened. Um, I actually told my wife, I said, man, I really could not imagine being Michael. Um, I had people messaging me through Facebook Messenger, uh, thousands upon thousands of people. uh, (laughs) Thousands? Thousands? Yes, on a a course of a matter of like two or three days. And I told my (laughs) wife, I said, I could not imagine what Mike went through. I mean, the response, I did not, honestly, I did not, um, first of all, I did not want that type of response, but I did not expect that type of response Mm -hmm. at all. I was just trying to give video evidence of something that I worked on. That's, Mm -hmm. That's it. And even at that point, I don't even think that I fully knew and understood. I had heard about the documentary, um, but I did not understand all that was actually going on until I actually started hearing a lot more about it. And then that's when I had to go and watch it. And so, as you can imagine, when I started watching the documentary, I'm looking for that scene of, you know, us in, um, in the actual hotel where we actually were where we actually were. And so, um, but getting back to the Michael Jackson fans, man, he has some of the most loyal fans around the world. I mean, they absolutely love this man. Um, I clearly see this man as an innocent person uh, in whom I really revere uh, for his talents and his giftings and a lot of his work around the world. Um, But I did not clearly, I clearly did not expect um, the many responses. I mean, people absolutely love this guy. Mm-hmm. I, I just couldn't imagine being in his shoes every day. I just couldn't imagine that. Well, well said. Last question for you, and because I, I know you got to go uh, off to church. Um, but uh, so you've already said you believe Michael Jackson is innocent. On a scale of zero to one hundred percent, what are the chances that Wade Robson was ever sexually abused by Michael Jackson, based upon your interaction with him? Zero. I agree with Absolutely that. Absolutely zero. I agree with that. Absolutely zero. All right. Well <laughs> said. Absolutely zero. Kevin, thanks so much for your time. Thanks for your honesty and your willingness to come forward and, and tell the truth. I really appreciate it, and uh, please keep in touch. Thank you. I appreciate it. I think you can probably tell for yourself that Kevin Lipsy is a credible person. Uh, I found him to be credible, not just because of what he was saying, but because he was what, what he was not saying. Uh, also because he has a corroborating witness that I've spoken to. Uh, I think he's very measured in what he is saying, although he clearly comes to a very firm conclusion, one that I agree with, and one that doesn't surprise me based upon his telling of the story. Part of why I find the story to be so credible and compelling is it completely dovetails, and I realize this is always dangerous. I, I I actually am one of those commentators and investigators who, when this happens... I actually hold the story to more scrutiny, not less, because I know uh, the dangers of confirmation bias. So because the story dovetails almost exactly with my view of what really happened in Leaving Neverland, I'm a little bit more wary of it, which is why I went the extra step to talk 
to Alan Smith, and I spoke several times to to Kevin Lipsy, and I I wanted to make sure that he has his ducks all in a row. But it's my view of this film that at least with Robson, and I don't know for sure about James Safechuck, the other accuser in this film, but with Robson, I really do believe he views his role here as an actor and that uh, he was essentially playing a part. This is consistent with Brandy Jackson, Michael Jackson's niece, and Wade Robson's former girlfriend that we interviewed right after the film came out, which really opened a lot of people's eyes and really convinced me that at least Robson was totally full of crap. But the way Lipsy tells the story, he was right there, and there was something that changed in Robson once Dan Reed starts filming his documentary. And that what, the way he's talking off camera and being a real person is totally different than he was for the documentary. And there was no doubt in Lipsy's mind that Robson is not telling the truth about being abused. Now, to be clear, uh, Lipsy has at least somewhat of a bias. He's a Michael Jackson fan. But it's also important to point out he didn't even know Michael Jackson uh, was directly re- re- related to what this event was all for or what Dan Reed was doing. So that's, I think, important for context as well. So I found Lipsy to be very credible. I think his his story is significant. I don't know that it's earth-shattering. I mean, nothing at this point is going to completely blow up leaving Neverland. The the standard that that is created in trying to to reverse a narrative like this is almost mind-blowing, and it's very, very frustrating. And I know this from my experience seven, eight years with the Penn State case. Once the media has latched on to a narrative, especially in this kind of a subject matter that's obviously very sensitive, it's nearly impossible to reverse. You need a nuclear weapon. In a rational world, I think Lipsy's story would be very impactful. I'm very realistic that all it's really going to do, at least for now, is further confirm uh, what people already have their suspicions of, which is that this entire endeavor is a fraud, that it's not based in reality, that Michael Jackson did not sexually abuse Wade Robson. And if he didn't, let's be clear, if he didn't abuse Wade Robson, then he didn't abuse James Safechuck either, even though there's problems with Safechuck's story. They're they're partners in the same lawsuit against Michael Jackson. Safechuck says that he became convinced of his own abuse by watching Robson on the Today Show. So you can't have one be a total liar and the other one be totally credible. It just doesn't work that way to think any other way uh, would not be credible. It would just be... It's just flat out ridiculous. And those are what I believe the claims are. I believe that the claims are ridiculous now. And Lipsy further substantiates that. Now, I've been mentioning a couple times over the last several weeks that we've been trying to schedule a lunch between me and uh, two of the primary lawyers for Michael Jackson's estate. And that finally happened this week. Uh, that Those lawyers are Brian Friedman and Howard Weitzman, uh, both are very high-powered lawyers. Weitzman's name you, you may know because he's been involved in a lot of high-profile situations. Part of what made this very uh, surreal for me in a lot of ways is that Howard Weitzman was O.J. Simpson's first attorney. In fact, it was Howard Weitzman who I believe – Uh, was the person who probably had the first substantive conversation with O.J. Simpson after he murdered Nicole Brown Simpson and Ronald Goldman, which, by the way, happened uh, 25 years ago this week. We'll be probably seeing a lot on that anniversary coming up uh, over the next uh, several days. And uh, Weitzman immediately recused himself from that case, hired Robert Shapiro. I have my theories as to why. You can probably figure out yourself as to why Howard Weitzman did that so quickly. Uh, there were both legal and maybe substantive reasons for, for why that occurred. Uh, and then the, the, the other part of that that is strange to me in this very strange situation is that so we had this lunch and we had the lunch literally right across the street from the old Metzaluna restaurant. The Metzaluna restaurant does no longer exist, but the Metzaluna restaurant is where Nicole Brown Simpson had her last meal and where Ronald Goldman who O.J. Simpson also slaughtered, was working and was why he ended up going over to Nicole Brown's place to return her glasses that she left at the restaurant that night. So that was weird. And then there's also an O.J. Simpson element. Now, people probably already know this. There's an O.J. Simpson element to my life since 
Uh, I was tangentially involved in O.J. Simpson going back to prison uh, for the whole Las Vegas situation, partially because I had dated Ron Goldman's sister, Kim, and felt like it was my obligation to try to keep the pressure on O.J. Simpson as much as possible. And then, just to finish off the O.J. connection to this whole business, that one of the uh, HBO lawyers is um, is Petroselli. I think it was the first name is Andrew. I think it's Andrew Petroselli, who was Kim Goldman and the Goldman family's lawyer against OJ in the civil case. So it's an incredibly <laughs> bizarre situation, very surreal. It kind of shows you, by the way, that the legal uh, environment in Los Angeles hasn't changed all that much in the last twenty five years. But um, so that was the background. Uh, and didn't necessarily relate to the substance uh, of the lunch, but uh, my, I have a very strange life, and I found this to be uh, an odd occurrence. I liked Howard, and I liked Brian maybe more than I expected to, because I don't really like people in general. Uh, I don't trust people, especially high-profile and high-powered people, because they always have an angle. So I'm not trusting, and I don't like humans, but, and, I, and I also you know, don't think very highly of most people. Uh, but my overall general assessment, and, and, and let me be clear, I'm, I'm only going to provide general assessment uh, of what happened in this lunch because I'm, I'm confused as to what was on the record and was off the record. So I'm going to basically assume that virtually everything was off the record out of respect for, for Howard and for Brian. But I do think there's some some takeaways that are important that people will be interested in. And so my general takeaway is, first of all, Howard and Brian are very smart people. They know what they're doing. Uh, So I I get that there's a lot of frustration on the part of the Jackson fan base about the estate and whether or not the estate is being aggressive enough and whether or not they have a handle on this situation. My my sense is uh, I was a little bit concerned during the lunch as to whether or not they were aggressive enough. Uh, because I'm an g- aggressive person by nature, and on this subject matter, I believe you got to go for the gusto. You, you, you cannot win by being conservative. You must be very, very aggressive. And I put out a, a few ideas that were very aggressive and have done so subsequent to that, put out some ideas that, uh, that are very aggressive. And to Howard and Brian's credit, they, I think that they have uh, considered them. I doubt that they'll actually uh, use them, but I, I feel confident that they actually have contemplated them and given them the, those ideas the respect that they deserve. And a lot of this was really just an exchange of ideas, information, uh, you know, theories about the case. Uh, we talked a lot about uh, w- what the motivations for uh, Robson and Safechuck are. We talked a little bit about Oprah Winfrey, uh, with whom Howard Weitzman has a relationship. Uh, by the way, I... I I am now convinced, and this is not uh, quoting uh, Howard or Brian, but I am now 100% convinced of something that I have uh, theorized for a, for a while, which is that Oprah Winfrey does not believe that uh, Wade Robson and James Safechuck were sexually abused by Michael Jackson. I don't know that she's 100% convinced that they, that they were not abused, but uh, gun to her head, there is no doubt in my mind that she would not feel confident in saying that they were sexually abused. And that's why she falls back on this bogus, this isn't about Michael Jackson canard. Uh, I don't know for sure what her motivation is, but I am more convinced now that this is really a, a corporate shell game. That this, 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 she just views Michael Jackson a, as a chess piece in her own game. And that because Michael Jackson's dead and he can't do anything to her anymore and she doesn't care about him, that she perceives it in her self-interest to to take a particular action, and that's why she's done this. It's not based in facts. She doesn't want to know the facts. She doesn't want to know the truth. She just wants to be able to have done her chess move and make it work for her without uh, a- any real uh, blowback or repercussions. And that's sad and it's unfortunate and uh, it's important because the easiest way for Leaving Neverland to be discredited in the public consciousness would be for Oprah to recant her support. 
I've never believed that that was realistic, although I thought it was worth a shot. Um, uh, and it's particularly frustrating because I don't believe that she really believes in the film. Uh, I do not believe that. And I never really have, but I'm more convinced of that now. Uh, as far as the motivations and and what's really going on in the big picture, one of the things I found interesting was that Howard and Brian disagree on some of that, uh, which I thought was healthy. I mean, they're, they're clearly thinking about this in an independent fashion. Uh, one is, I would say, maybe a little more, quote-unquote, conspiratorial than the other. And I'm I'm anti-conspiracy uh, person to begin with, but I'm becoming convinced... <laughs> And again, I cannot talk about the details, but this is not based upon uh, pure conjecture. But I am becoming, uh, not conspiratorial, but I'm con- becoming convinced that there is a whole lot more going on with regard to why Leaving Neverland was made and the, re- the nature of the reaction to it uh, than I was previously understanding. There's a lot going on. This is almost the Game of Thrones situation, folks. And it has almost nothing to do with sexual abuse. And has almost nothing, to, certainly nothing to do with Michael Jackson being a sexual abuser of Wade Robson and James Safechuck. And I can, and I can assure you this, uh, and, and this might be the most important thing that you take out of, of my lunch with Howard Weitzman and, and Brian Friedman, and that is there is zero doubt on their part that Michael Jackson did not abuse these guys. Zero doubt. This is not a situation where the estate is trying to defend their financial interests and they don't care what the truth is and they're just you know, going to do whatever it takes to keep the money rolling in. Uh, obviously, that's their motivation, which causes some conflicts. I mean, it makes things more difficult because it's not a situation where Michael Jackson is still alive, and, and he's trying to defend his name. Their, their job is to protect the estate, and that makes things a little bit more complicated than it would be normally because I totally get, and I told Howard Weitzman this, I totally get why if the estate is still sound, why you might not take as many chances in defending your name as you would if someone was still alive. Because your motivation is different. Your goals are different. But there is zero doubt in my mind that these guys know what the truth is, they care about what the truth is, and that their goal here is for the truth to win. And that was appealing to me. Now, I'm still hesitant about the whole thing because, one, my wife has warned me about getting involved in another Penn State situation, and that was a horrible experience, and I, you know, finding the truth didn't do me any good at all. In fact, it destroyed me in a lot of ways in finding the truth in that whole situation. Uh, there are some differences, but there are obviously some, a lot of similarities in all of this. Uh, so I'm not willing and able to, to dive fully in, um, but I'm interested in trying to help justice if I can. And, uh, and if that means, you know, giving them some advice or hearing them out on, on what their theories are, or what their plans are, I'm more than willing to do that. Uh, so oh, by and large, it was a positive lunch. The, the follow-up phone call was, was positive. I, I think we're on similar pages. Obviously, everyone has their own uh, level of aggressiveness or lack of aggressiveness, and I fully well realize that I am way more aggressive than most people. But I, I, if you're a Jackson fan who is concerned about the estate not being aggressive enough, I don't think you need to worry about that. I think the Jackson estate, the, 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 at least uh, Weitzman and Friedman, they know what they're doing. I'm not someone who, who uh, easily trusts blindly, and I'm not suggesting anyone do that. But I think that they have a handle on the situation. As far as the the HBO lawsuit is concerned, I think they feel very strongly that that contract, as as strangely as it's written in retrospect, is very much on their side. It's an, it kind of an unusual situation where they're using a non-disparagement clause from a contract that was created back in 1992, I believe, for an HBO special that Michael Jackson did for them, and saying, oh, wait a minute, you signed a non-disparagement that's still... Uh, in play into perpetuity. And, you know, what's kind of interesting to me about that is that that legal argument is kind of emblematic of the whole case. 
Because in retrospect, you know, it seems kind of strange. I mean, it's hard to interpret. Well, how in the world could a 1992 concert contract prohibit HBO from doing a documentary in 2019 about Michael Jackson and sexual abuse? But you have to remember the context of the time. In 1992, Michael Jackson is the biggest star in the world. He has all the leverage in, in literally in the world. HBO is the biggest thing that they've done to that date. So in those negotiations, it is perfectly rational to interpret everything as being exactly as it's stated and, and, to, and to interpret everything exactly as, uh, you know, would be in the favor of Michael Jackson because he has all the leverage. So, yes, I can see and I think this is really the only concern that the lawyers have is that some 2019 judge might not understand that full context and might go, oh, wait a minute, I realize this is what the contract says, but that seems ridiculous all these years later and just arbitrarily decide that the contract doesn't say what it actually says. But there's a very strong argument to be made, though, wait a minute, it's, that's exactly what was intended because that's where all the leverage was. And that's, when I say it's emblematic of the larger case, you also have to understand with Michael Jackson – his actions back in that time period, even with these two accusers, have to be interpreted through the lens of this being the most famous man in the world who's worth ridiculous amounts of money and who looks at the world in a very, very different way. He's living a truly unique experience, and therefore you can't interpret all of his actions in the same way you would a normal person. And so that's why a large part of why I have uh, shifted my belief about whether or not Michael Jackson in general was a sexual abuser. I am positive that he did not abuse James Safechuck or Wade Robson, or about as positive as I can be. And if they're lying, then it certainly seems to me as if there's a very good chance that none of these allegations are actually true. So uh, anyway, I, I will keep you updated on if anything happens with regard to the the Jackson estate lawyers. I really don't know whether or not there'll be any uh, contact in the future, uh, but it was an interesting lunch, and I think that these guys you know, know what they're doing. They've got a handle on things, and I wish them the best because I, I want there to be justice to be done. I want the truth to win. Uh, I, I'm always very concerned and, and pessimistic about whether or not the truth can win, especially in this kind of a situation. But if any guy, anybody can pull it off, these guys can because they actually have resources. It's an unusual situation where people fighting against uh, you know, a colossal narrative actually have resources and brain power and the wherewithal to get this done. So I'll be very curious to see what happens, and if I can help in some way, I will. A couple other notes uh, regarding what's going on with Leaving Neverland. There was an article uh, on Friday in Variety about the anniversary of Michael Jackson's death coming up, the 10th anniversary, which is later on this month, which was really uh, quite devastating, uh, more from a perception standpoint than a reality perspective. But the entire article was about this, uh, all the projects that had been planned for the 10th anniversary that are now kaput because of the reaction to leaving Neverland and basically anything Michael Jackson is too toxic to get done, at least currently in this environment. And the, the, my two, a couple takeaways from the Variety article. Number one, uh, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy because especially in Hollywood where perception is everything, if Variety writes that something is toxic – then guess what? It becomes toxic. And so if it wasn't already toxic, it becomes for real toxic now. That's number one. Number two, the level of detail in the story is disturbing and strange because for a story like this to get written, there's no way that Variety knocked on every single door of everybody who makes content, which is now you know a ridiculous number of people in, in the entertainment business, and asked, hey, you got any Michael Jackson projects that are getting torched because of leaving Neverland? I mean, that would take a ridiculous amount of time. It's not realistic. It's not the world we currently live in. So for this level of detail to be reported on by one person, they're not going to send – I mean, it would take months and months – uh, of a full-scale investigation to find this kind of information out, somebody had to come to them. 
And who came to them is a very interesting question because I don't have an answer to that. But it's, it's important to point out that somebody is coming to them with this kind of information. Maybe not in all the circumstances, but at least in some. Because, again, you would need enough breadcrumbs to know where to go. And there's no way you would know to go, where to go based upon the, the nature of the article, especially in this day and age where Variety is not paying a dozen people for weeks to investigate what projects are being killed off because of leaving Neverland. That's just not going to happen. And so I think it's important to point out that somebody clearly has an agenda here. This is a corporate agenda that we're seeing in that Variety article. But you know what? That, that corporate agenda may have been short-sighted. Because even though in the short run it's damaging to the Jackson estate by creating this perception that everything Michael Jackson is toxic, even around his t- the 10th anniversary of his death, at least here in America. It might not be internationally because there's some other things internationally that are going on that don't seem to be impacted. But at least here in America, there seems to be at least a temporary uh, toxicity issue. But whoever uh, or, or whatever forces were behind this, we're very short-sighted because what they're also doing is helping the estate's lawsuit against HBO because it's proof of damage because that's one of the things that the HBO lawsuit is going to need eventually is proof of damage done by HBO. Well, this Variety article is a perfect example of that. So whoever's behind this is either not very smart or or is rather short-sighted. I'm not sure which, but uh, I I did find that to be uh, of interest. There was another article I want to mention that was a little older in Deadline. And this is just amazing. It's It's a perfect example of how journalism is totally dead. But Deadline did an article about the director of Leaving Neverland, Dan Reed. Uh, where Dan Reed defends his controversial film, and he says, I stand by every second. And it was basically a Dan Reed fluff piece. And it was written by a guy by the name of Matt Carey. Well, Matt Carey is not a deadline staff writer. But who is Matt Carey? Well, if you go to mattcareybooks.com, it's obvious that Matt Carey is effectively a sex uh, abuse activist. Now, to me, that that ought to at least be cited in the article. I, to my knowledge, it's not. I, I, I'm pretty sure it's not. So if I somehow missed it, I I, I don't think I did. But I mean, the, the, for the idea that he even was allowed to write this article is absurd. I mean, how do you have someone who is a sex abuse activist write a news article about Dan Reed defending his film about sex abuse without at least mentioning that? And and he's not even a staff writer. He's apparently a freelancer. So this is going to be a super softball to begin with. The guy obviously believes, I mean, you have to understand the nature of a sex abuse activist. Sex abuse activists, it's basically against their religion to disbelieve any accusation of child sex abuse. And so, therefore, he's not an objective person to write this article. And so, of course, you're going to get a fluff piece uh, in Deadline, which, again, is an is a, a outlet that's read widely, especially in the entertainment industry here in Los Angeles, and it has an impact. On the bright side, Celine Dion, of all people, apparently has given an interview where she has defended Michael Jackson. So I was happy to see that. And it's interesting to see that people like Madonna, Celine Dion, Britney Spears, I still believe, with that video she put out with Michael Jackson's music, who used to date Wade Robson and uh, worked with Wade Robson, was making her statement on this very, very clear. Uh, Boy George. There have been some other people who have been defending Michael Jackson against Uh, obviously an environment that is not conducive to doing that. So I thought that was good news. I also want to mention, and this may or may not be related to the the lunch, but I received a a direct message a couple of weeks ago on Twitter from a media personality who is Oprah-like. She's not quite at Oprah's level. I mean, no one's really at Oprah's level, but she's at the level just below Oprah, and she, uh, out of the blue, contacted me and thanked me for my, my work in general and specifically with regard to my defense of Michael Jackson. And this really shocked me, not just because I, I was shocked to hear from this person out of the blue, 
but also because uh, this person is associated with the Me Too movement. And so for them to, at least in private, and I don't even know if I'm allowed to say their name, so I'm not going to. Maybe someday I will. I'm sure someday I will. But, uh, but not right now. Uh, but you would know this person's name 100%. Uh, that they uh, wanted to express gratitude for someone pursuing the truth on leaving Neverland, considering not only their stature but their their position on Me Too, I thought to be very, very significant. So the people who are really in the know and don't have an agenda here, they all get it. They know this is all bull crap. And, uh, and, and so that at least uh, is heartening in some ways. And hopefully at some point I'll be able to give you more information on that. Uh, obviously, I've always related this story to the Penn State Joe Paterno, Jerry Sandusky story. And there was a development there this week, which in a rational world would have the media all in a, titty, a tizzy and willing uh, and able to at least take another look at what really happened in that travesty. But imagine this, folks. Imagine you have this massive alleged scandal, the Penn State Joe Paterno, Jerry Sandusky story, where you've got uh, Jerry Sandusky in prison for the rest of his life. You have two administrators who pled guilty. They didn't think they were going to jail, but they ended up going to jail because they were basically lied to. You got a third administrator who was convicted of a misdemeanor, who uh, a federal court tossed out his conviction, but now the state is appealing. That's Graham Spanier, the former president of the Penn State. So you have all these these horrendous repercussions of this massive scandal. And imagine if the primary prosecutor, the lead prosecutor on the Sandusky case, and the guy who was at the forefront of the charge against the Penn State administrators, at least at the beginning, Frank Fina. Frank Fina just had it recommended to the state Supreme Court that his law license be suspended for a year and a day. Not for something unrelated to this, for his actions directly related to the case. Imagine that. Now, this has not been done officially yet, but if if history is any judge, he's going to lose his law license for at least a year. And when that happens, I guarantee you it's going to be a minor blip uh, that no one's going to say, wait a minute, hold on a second. Everything about this case, we're relying on Frank Fina. Frank Fina's fingertips are everywhere. And by the way, the only pornography found in the entire case, which is unheard of in a, in a serial pedophilia case, especially when it comes to uh, male-on-boy sex, the only pornography found was found in the email of the investigators and the prosecutors and some of the judges, including the email of Frank Fina. So you got Frank Fina being found with pornography and Frank Fina's misconduct with regard to the Penn State General Counsel, Cynthia Baldwin, his actions were so egregious that the state Supreme Court appears as if it's about to suspend his law license for over a year. And the media is just going to go, oh, boy, that's kind of strange. Yeah, well, no, no need to take another look at this. It's absurd. It's, it's, it's just unbelievable. You cannot be serious. But the media has its narrative, and the, they have their fairy tale, and they don't want to relook at this because I think they sense that if they do, they're going to be exposed as the frauds that they are because they didn't do their job. They bought into a bullshit story that's a complete fraud, and I've proven the whole thing, and you can find out more about that at framingpaterno.com. There's a Joe Paterno, Michael Jackson angle, I think, in another story involving Martin Luther King Jr. This is amazing, and I'm going to probably write about this for Mediate in the next day or two, but uh, most people probably haven't even heard about what's going on with Martin Luther King Jr. It's amazing. Uh, this this story, which is um, in The Guardian, I think uh, in, in a lot of ways represents everything I believe about the Martin Luther King FBI story, only uh, from the opposite direction, because it kind of proves how in the tank the media is for Martin Luther King Jr. But you probably haven't even heard about this because the media has essentially censored, censored the story. So here's the story from The Guardian. Headline, a historian's claims about Martin Luther King are shocking and irresponsible. Subheadline, a recent essay claims the civil rights leader was present during a rape but the evidence is shaky, and there's reason to be skeptical. And then the article 
by Adana Merch goes on, The troubling legacy of Martin Luther King, a controversial essay recently published by American historian David Garrow in a conservative British magazine, has met with ambivalence in the American press and sparked fierce debate among historians. Armed with salacious archival material from a recent FBI documents release, Garrow has written a shocking account of the iconic civil rights leader's sexual misconduct, ranging from numerous extramarital affairs and solicitation of prostitutes to the allegation that he was present during the violent rape of a Maryland churchgoer. Garrow, a Pulitzer Prize-winning King biographer and historian of the civil rights era, insists that a, quote, fundamental reconsideration of Martin Luther King's historical reputation is imminent. Indeed, Michael... Uh, Moshbacher, a columnist for Standpoint, the magazine that agreed to publish the essay after it was rejected by publications including the Atlantic, Washington Post, New York Times, and Guardian which is what I'm reading from, went even further, arguing that the FBI recordings, quote, reveal King to be the Harvey Weinstein of the civil rights movement. The debate about Garrow's sensational revelations has prompted a compelling exchange among professional historians about the standards of historical evidence and the use of intelligence sources. King's sexual indiscretions have long been known or suspected. The more explosive claim in Garrow's almost 8,000-word story hinges on a handwritten annotation on an FBI report alleging that King was present during a woman's rape and not only failed to intervene but actively encouraged the attack. The intelligence document Garrow cites a summary report Though, did, though not a direct transcript of the clandestine FBI recordings of King, nestles the rape allegation within a broader account of King's multiple affairs with married and unmarried women, participation in orgies, and direct exchange of money for sex. The report's cover page is dated 1975, five years after King's death, but it is unclear when it was produced. The document describes how King and a handful of Southern Christian Leadership Conference officials checked into Washington's D.C. Willard Hotel along with several women parishioners. The group met in his room and discussed which women among the parishioners would be suitable for natural and and unnatural sex acts, the report states. When one of the women protested that she did not approve of this, one of King's colleagues immediately and forcibly raped her. The document does not name the alleged rapist, but Garrow identifies him as Reverend Logan Curse, a Baptist minister from Baltimore. Alongside that typed passage are three barely legible, not sure why that matters, barely legible handwritten notes that include two editorial suggestions and the addition of an explosive new claim, quote, King looked on, laughed, and offered advice. Amazingly, Garrow hangs his entire claim of King's participation in a sexual assault on this tenuous handwritten notation. Particularly suspect is the description of King looking on, given that the report was supposedly drawn from audio recordings only. I'm not sure how that's much of a stretch. I mean, if you've got an audio recording of all these guys in the same room while you hear a rape going on, uh, and one of them's giving advice on how to handle the rape, I think it's pretty fair to say King's looking on, but I digress. Garrow's argument rests on a shaky evidentiary trail. We have no tangible proof of a recording, nor a transcript in the public record, although one eventually is going to come out when all this is uh, declassified years from now. That's me talking. More importantly, there is no way to verify who edited the transcripts or when. William C. Sullivan, the FBI official who directed the King's surveillance, died in a hunting accident in 1977, and nearly all the other figures in the report, including Curse, who passed away in 1991, are dead. All right, now those, that's all relevant. It's important. And I, I have no problem with the uh, caution here. Because you're, you're talking about a dead man's legacy, right? You're talking about a, destroying an icon in the history of America. A guy who actually has a national holiday named for him. Uh, a guy, I would say that my uh, seven-year-old daughter, Grace Ziegler, knows probably four uh, figures in American history for sure. Uh, George Washington, Abraham Lincoln, Donald Trump, and maybe Barack Obama, and certainly Martin Luther King. In fact, I've done videotapes with her, uh, uh, two of them you can find on YouTube, about her, uh, what she's learned about Martin Luther King at school. And so, uh, and she, she reveres him, because she's been taught to revere him in school. So I'm all for caution. But where was the caution when it came to Joe Paterno? 
being dead and having far, far less credible uh, evidence of him looking the other way towards Jerry Sandusky's sex abuse. I mean, it was completely bogus what happened once Joe Paterno was dead. And in a lawsuit, a lawsuit, there's no lawsuit here, a lawsuit where people are looking for free money. From Penn State, millions of dollars. They make up some cockamamie BS stories from 30, 40 years prior in the early 1970s. I happen to know who these accusers are. They're full of crap. Their stories are absurd. They're laughable. And yet the news media picked up on those under the guise that, well, it's court documents. Court documents must be true. So we're just going to copy and paste and retweet, and the whole thing's going to explode, and we're going to put the last nail in the coffin of Joe Paterno's legacy over total bullshit. It's the exact same situation. Incredibly old claims, almost from the exact same time period. Involving sex abuse. In this case, Paterno wasn't even directly involved. He was supposedly uh, covering it up, looking the other way, telling the accusers to go pound sand, leave me alone, I got a football team to worry about. All of which was bullshit. All of which was done not contemporaneously in lawsuits. And yet the media lapped that up and destroyed an American icon over that kind of information. There was no restraint whatsoever. Nothing at all like, you know, you know, shocking claims are irresponsible in a headline. Nothing. Just court documents say Paterno covered up sex abuse. And then, uh, you know, the, the regurgitation of these BS claims with no corroboration, no logic. And then, of course, there's also Michael Jackson. Michael Jackson is dead. And HBO allows people who have been on the record defending him four hours unmolested. Well, unmolested is the wrong word to say, but, but without any scrutiny at all, no scrutiny, no other side whatsoever. We're going to give them four hours, and then we're going to sanctify it with Oprah Winfrey about a dead guy. Where's the restraint there? Where's the irresponsibility there? So how about some consistency? This is a, I'm not saying we know for 100% sure this is what happened, but this is a contemporaneous FBI investigation document that apparently has a recording and a transcript attached to it. I, I, I mean, we ought to at least be taking it seriously and not dismissing it out of hand and not censoring it, especially after what we did to Joe Paterno and Michael Jackson. How about some damn consistency here, people? But the reality is Martin Luther King is untouchable. He's too valuable to the liberal establishment media. Michael Jackson and Joe Paterno were not that. And so that's why there's this massive hypocrisy and double standard. Uh, Speaking of um, (laughs) political correctness, I have to mention my favorite political correctness story maybe of all time occurred this past week involving uh, golf instructor Hank Haney. Hank Haney was a Tiger Woods instructor for several key years. And Hank Haney has been in the news because he had the audacity prior to last week's Women's U.S. Open Golf Tournament to jokingly predict that a Korean was going to win the tournament, probably someone named Lee. And the reason why he did that was because... Well, let's face it, almost all the top golfers on the LPGA Tour are Korean, and many of them are named Lee. And so he was making a joke about this, and he got torched. He got suspended from his serious satellite radio show. Tiger Woods attacked him, which was awfully rich, given uh, Tiger Woods' misogynistic uh, background. Uh, uh, and so he gets, he gets completely torched over this. Well, what ends up happening? You can't make this up. A Korean named Lee wins the U.S. Open, just as he suggested. Not just a Korean named Lee, a Korean named Lee Six. She actually puts the na- number six in her name because there's that many Lees on the LPGA Tour. So she needed to identify herself as Lee Six. It's actually her real name now. And then, so Hank Haney gets crushed for the joke. It's just a freaking joke. More than legitimate. And then when he's right... No one puts it in the proper context in the media because they already have their narrative. And Haney even gets crushed for defending himself, saying, hey, I was right, and here's why. I mean, nothing tells political correctness, shows political correctness more dramatically than making a joke about a prediction, being right about the prediction, getting crushed for the prediction, and then getting crushed again when you explain why you were right about the prediction. That's the crazy world we're living in right now. 
And it's just... It's just flat out ridiculous. But that's the world we live in. Although we're not going to live in this world for very much longer, apparently. Because according to a new Australian uh, study, the uh, global warming is going to destroy human civilization by 2050. Human civilization will be destroyed by 2050 thanks to global warming. As you probably know, I am not a believer in catastrophic man-made global warming, at least not that it's been proven or that we can do anything about it or that it would be worth trying to do anything about it. I believe this is uh, much ado about very little, that there's extrapolation of bad data going on, and that this study is another perfect example of that. But I also find it amazing. It's an amazing coincidence, amazing coincidence, that all these doomsday predictions, they always come to fruition at the earliest date that those who author the predictions are confident they will no longer be around to be accountable. Isn't that amazing? I mean, think about this. If you're in your 50s, right? If you're in your 50s and you're a climate scientist and you're making a doomsday prediction, what would be the perfect date for the doomsday to occur? Well, if you're in your 50s, you want it to be when you're in your 80s because you're probably going to either going to be dead or you're going to be in a rest home or no one's going to care. Your career is going to be long over. It's, there's going to be no blowback to you. Well, isn't it amazing? Isn't it amazing that 2050 is the new date, at least according to this Australian survey, that, uh, that global warming is going to not just uh, ruin the environment but destroy human civilization by 2050? You know, I have no interest in living to 2050. I really don't. My goal is to live at least to 72, 75 range, get my kids out of college, maybe see a wedding. After that, I have no interest in living. Uh, that's even if I'm in good health because you know, life is barely worth living as it is when, I'm, you know, when you're young. But when you're that old, I really don't see the value in it. I mean, who knows what will be happening then. You know, if, if my kids are giving me some reason to hang around, then I will. But I got to tell you, this actually gives me a motivation to live to 2050. Just, just to get to 2050, just so I can, uh, you know, say, go fuck yourselves, you were wrong, and then I can die. Because I'm so damn sick and tired of this bullshit. It is such obvious bullshit. And yet, uh, and no, there'll never be any accountability because there's inherent plausible deniability in the prediction because those people won't be around and they'll probably, the prediction will probably be forgotten anyway. It's it's a lot like what Trump does. They understand if you make a prediction for doomsday, people get all freaked out, but there'll never be any accountability. And by the way, that you can always claim, well, it, it didn't happen because we stopped it from happening. It's the perfect scam. Anyway, all right, that'll do it for an extended edition of the World According to Zig podcast. Again, please make sure you check out the Individual One podcast as well. Uh, we may or may not, I'm not sure yet, be doing another episode on Father's Day. It depends on what my family has uh, planned for me on Father's Day and how the U.S. Open is going. So, so, so it depends. We're, we're, we're in a holding pattern whether or not we do another one next weekend, but there will be another episode of the World Going to Zig uh, soon. As is always the case, I ask only two things of you. Please make sure that uh, you share this via social media, Twitter, Facebook, word of mouth, what have you. And uh, also, number two, do yourself a favor. If you're one of those people who sleeps when you sleep, you use sheets, please pay attention to this important message. My name is John Ziegler. Our website is freespeechbroadcasting.com. Coffee? Oh, thanks. How did you sleep? Ugh, like a baby. I don't want to get out of bed, ever. These sheets are mm, incredibly soft. What did you say they're called again? Performance bedding by Sheiks. <laughs> performance bedding? <laughs> yeah. They're made from super high-tech performance fabric. They're incredibly breathable, so you're not waking up at night throwing covers off and then an hour later throwing them back on. Huh. No wonder I slept so good. Since I started using Sheiks, I sleep like a baby. No more sweaty nights for me. No? Well. <laughs> well, I like them because they're soft. They feel like, mm, silk. Performance fabric, huh? Maybe we should, oh, I don't know. Try them out again. <laughs> <laughs> Comfort and performance for better sleep. That's Sheiks. S-H-E-E-X. Sheiks. Try Sheiks for 30 nights risk-free. Go to sleepcoolnow.com. Use promo code 1212 and get $40 off any sheet set. That's sleepcoolnow.com, promo code 1212. Sleepcoolnow.com, one, two, one, two.